Welcome, let's take a look at our top story. Protesters against President Donald Trump gathered and marched in Washington, D.C. as votes were being counted in the United States just after midnight. Video footage showed protesters marching and singing as they marched down 17th Street in D.C. towards the Black Lives Matter Plaza near the White House. Demonstrations in the nation's capital have remained largely peaceful with only three protesters arrested close to the White House. Joe Biden and Donald Trump are locked in a tight race as the uncounted votes remain. Meanwhile, Joe Biden has won Arizona. Democratic nominee for presidential race Biden has flipped a state that usually votes for Republicans and takes 11 electoral votes that come with the win. Now, this has happened for the first time that Arizona has picked a Democratic presidential candidate in 24 years. Biden's victory comes after a whirlwind of activity as both campaigns worked to capture residents votes. For about two months leading up to election day and especially in the final few weeks, Arizonans saw regular visits from the Trump campaign, including the president and vice president Mike Pence multiple times. Biden and his running mate Kamala Harris visited Arizona in person in October and held events here or online geared toward the state's voters. With 83% of the votes counted, Biden has a vote margin of 51.2%, while Trump's vote share stands at 47.4%. Now, according to the exit polls, Trump's supporting a support eroding among the older voters and white men. Polls show that Trump appears to have lost some support among white men and older people in Georgia and Virginia. These are key parts of his voter base. While Trump is still winning the majority of those voters, some of them switched to supporting his Democratic opponent, Joe Biden. Reuters polling edition uh, editor has, Chris Khan is uh, bringing us more on this. Take a look. I'm Chris Kahn, Reuters polling editor. There's still a lot to go tonight. A lot of states have not been called yet. We are seeing in the state of Florida, it, it's very, very close between Joe Biden and Donald Trump. Now, we know from uh, the way that the state collects its uh, mail-in ballots and the way, you know, what we've seen in pre-election polls, that uh, uh, Democrats were going to be counted early. Uh, a much more Republican-leading part of the electorate was going to be counted late. So I got to say, it doesn't look that great for Joe Biden right now, although I must say, state has not been called yet. It's very, very close. Um, we are also seeing some broad trends in the electorate, stuff that we were expecting to see, um, but we're seeing it really play out in real time in some of the key battleground states. We were, we were expecting to see uh, an erosion in support uh, for Donald Trump among some groups that he had expected to come out for him. We're talking about whites without a college degree, older voters. Uh, we're seeing, for example, uh, in Georgia, uh, Trump is getting about 7 out of 10 among all whites. Uh, that's down from about 8 out of 10 four years ago. Uh, he's also getting about 5 out of 10, 10 whites with a college degree uh, in Georgia. That's down from about 7 out of 10 four years ago. So he's still doing, you know, getting the majority of these groups, but just not as well as he did four years ago. We're seeing uh, Trump getting about 6 out of 10 uh, uh, whites without a college degree in Virginia. That's down from 7 out of 10 uh, four years ago. And so we're seeing, in, in general, th this is uh, a group that Trump had expected to come out for him. And he's always been very popular with. But we were wondering ahead of the election how many of these folks were going to show up for him one more time. We're seeing that, at least in some of these states, they may not be showing up in force like he had been hoping for. One of the numbers that we're seeing right now from exit, exit polls is, is Trump is getting about 5 out of 10 among Latinos in Florida. He's basically splitting the Latino vote with Joe Biden. Uh, that's much better than he did uh, in, in 2016. Democrats are hoping that disaffected Republicans, suburban women and black and Latino voters will help them to clinch Pennsylvania's 20 electoral votes and 
avoid a sequel to Donald Trump's unexpected victory there in 2016. But the initial trends portray a different picture. Pennsylvania epitomizes the divisions, loyalties, and the shifting political currents of the 2020 presidential race. The mostly white battleground state where four years ago, President Trump narrowly became the first Republican to win a presidential contest since 1988, is once again balanced between staunch Republican loyalty in its rural center and resurgent Democratic Party in its urban and suburban areas. 69% of the estimated vote total has been reported. As of now, the figures show Trump leading with 56.5% of the votes and Joe Biden with approximately 42%. Wisconsin, which has 10 electoral votes to give, there is a narrow Biden lead on the strength of the heavily Democratic ballots with the window closing for Trump. Trump has 49.1% of the vote share, while Biden is leading with 49.4% of votes. In 2016, Donald Trump became the first Republican presidential candidate to win Wisconsin since 1984. He narrowly defeated Hillary Clinton by roughly 23,000 votes. Now, it is among the election's swing states, and polls have suggested that entering Election Day, Wisconsin has been tilting considerably in Biden's favor. In Georgia, again, Trump is leading with 50.5% of votes, while Joe Biden is behind with 48.3% of the votes. On the other hand, in North Carolina, with 94% of the votes counted, Trump is leading with 50.1% of the votes, while Biden is uh, falling behind with 48.7% of the votes. Our correspondent, Sarah Walton, continues to bring us all the latest developments from Florida. Listen in. We really are in un uncharted territory, really, here. Uh, Joe, uh, Donald Trump, uh, as we heard a moment ago, uh, suggesting that uh, votes being counted after uh, the end of the main uh, election day here is somehow evidence of fraud. That, it, that is simply not, not true. There are votes that uh, have come into polling stations and are, are still in the process of, of being counted. And, and to be honest, it's it's really not even clear at this moment if, if uh, the president would have the legal pathway to do that via the Supreme Court. It's, it's not clear yet exactly how that is going to proceed. I, I think what we can see and what we are already seeing, even though it's, it's very late and it's the early hours of the morning here in the United States, is, is just huge amounts of angst and concern about you know, the uncertainty that this uh, is creating and we had already uh, seen in the, the the days running up to this election uh, cities particularly across the United States uh, taking security measures uh, boarding up shops the White House itself actually has barricades up around it should there be signs of any violence with people reacting unhappily angrily to uh, the results coming in or a, an attempt to uh, stop votes being counted I, I think the longer this drags on the more contentious it becomes, the more likely it is going to be that we will see people coming out onto the streets to react. Donald Trump eventually sort of eked ahead. It was eventually called with 51.3% uh, of the vote for, for Donald Trump, 478 for Joe Biden. And actually, that's Donald Trump extending his lead uh, in Florida compared to the 2016 uh, election. Uh, really crucial announcement that uh, announcement that here in Florida because um, had Joe Biden won here it would have been game over for Donald Trump there was, there was pretty much no way he would have been able to gain the 270 electoral votes he would need to make it back to uh, the White House for another four years um, with a loss for Joe Biden here I mean it's not essentially over for him there is still the, the potential that he could win uh, thanks to the result in other um, swing states but uh, what we are seeing is with other places such as Pennsylvania Wisconsin they are taking far longer to count their ballots particularly mail-in ballots that have come in and so we are seeing this dragging out of the process it, it, potentially uh, on to Wednesday, later in Wednesday, maybe even later in the week, where we, we're going to get an idea of who it is that's won. 
While all eyes are on the battle between red and blue states, the Democrats and Republicans are also eyeing at the upper chamber, the Senate. As of now, the Republicans have a 47-53 majority in the Senate, but this year's election has only 35 Senate seats up for grabs. Some are considered to be competitive, where the seats can be flipped. Now, Republicans are defending 23 seats, while the Democrats are defending 12. If Joe Biden wins the presidency, then the Democrats need a net gain of the three seats to win control of the Senate. But if Trump is re-elected, then the Democrats need four seats to attain majority. Interestingly, the GOP lawmakers are distancing themselves from President Trump. Many have, seen urging, have been seen urging voters to vote for the most capable senator who best represents their state and their point of view. GOP Senators Mitt Romney of Utah and Lisa Murkowski of Alaska and Susan Collins of Maine have diverged policy ideas from Trump. Now, a few Senate Republicans have decided to spend a lot more on a new wave of coronavirus relief aid, stalling out on a deal with Democrats to approve a $2 trillion plan. The Senate is critically important in passing important legislations and winning both the presidency and Congress would give either party a massive opportunity to set the agenda on everything from health care to taxes to environmental policy. Now, in the last four years, the Senate played a strategic role in handling over the, in handing over the baton to the Republicans for all of the crucial decisions. In July of 2018, Trump nominated Brett Kavanaugh for Associate Justice of the U.S. Supreme Court, now, even after the accusations of sexual assault charges. Senate voted 50 to 48 to confirm his nomination. In March of 2019, U.S. Attorney General William Barr concluded Special Counsel Robert Mueller's report about the investigation into Russian interference in the 2016 presidential election. Barr said that no conclusion was reached by the Special Counsel, noting that Mueller wrote, while this report does not conclude that the president committed a crime, it also does not exonerate him. After Trump was impeached in the White House, uh, in the House of Representatives, in February of 2020, the Senate voted 52 to 48, finding Trump not guilty on charges of abuse of power, and voted 53 to 47, acquitting Trump on the charges of obstruction of Congress. In September of 2020, Trump nominated Amy Coney Barrett as the U.S. Supreme Court judge, this to fill a vacancy that was left behind by the death of Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Now, a week before the election day, the Senate voted to confirm Barrett's nomination. Due to the surge in mail-in voting this cycle, it could take a while to know exactly which party takes control of the Senate, but the battle seems neck and neck. India is closely watching the U.S. elections. The relations between the two countries grew in the last four years. And just last month, India and the U.S. held the 2 plus 2 ministerial level dialogue in New Delhi. The two nations also signed the crucial the uh, Becker defense deal of satellite data. Now, India and the U.S. are also holding the Malabar naval exercise along with other coordinations of Japan and China. Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi and U.S. President Donald Trump also share a strong personal relation, which uh, was visible at the Namaste Trump event in India earlier this year. The relations between the two countries have also taken center stage amid the Chinese aggression. Remember, the U.S. election is taking place amid India-China border standoff. Tensions have also been rising between Washington and Beijing. This, as the Trump administration has accused China of covering up the initial coronavirus outbreak. Former High Commissioner and former Information Advisor at Prime Minister's Office, G. Patrashtri, has given us more perspective on this listening. Let's be very clear of one thing. Internally, uh, America is becoming much more divided on racial lines. I've never, I've served in America, I've been there three and a half years. I have never seen this sort of racial undercurrents, uh, and I visited every year uh, in the United States. And generally, President Trump takes the 
uh, blame for that in the US itself. But coming to relations with India, you know, one in interesting thing that India has, it has a bipartisan consensus. Right now, the, uh, uh, the entire relationship resolves around uh, the uh, 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 Indian Ocean Association of uh, Japan, Australia, uh, India and the US. Uh, uh, and there is bipartisan support for that. It, in fact, the entire concept of the Indo-Pacific came from President Obama and it's been followed through. Most importantly, the Pentagon is completely in favor of it. So with India, there is a bipartisan consensus. The problems we have with the US really uh, are trade with regard to the sanctions and the extra, extra duties which uh, Trump has imposed on our imports. We are discussing that. I am sure we can resolve it. But the hardcore thing is the is is the Indo-Pacific uh, partnership, and all four countries recently even have had military exercises or are having them. Now, therefore, the uh, ties at so and so far as security are concerned uh, go back now. Uh, I, I can't recall any time uh, in in my career that they have been as good as they are now. And happily, we have not got involved in their internal rivalries. Uh, we even, uh, you know, the, the, the much uh, touted thing of having an Indian as a vice presidential candidate. Really, it, it doesn't matter. She's American first. And, uh, and therefore, I am, I, am, I am persuaded our Indian relation. One more little point. Afghanistan. Afghanistan. It's now loom, the Americans are more or less set to withdraw ground forces. And what the Afghans want and what we would support is they retain a, a, a measure of air power in Afghanistan. But that's a matter of detail. And therefore, there is a good dialogue. Uh, the Prime Minister has an excellent relationship with uh, President uh, Trump, one of the very few leaders who has that sort of a relationship. And therefore, I, I have no worries on this score, uh, in, in, uh, whoever gets elected.